Welcome to Gene Cannabis TV. You're, you're here. You made it for episode 599. You got your host, Dank, and with me, we have some special guests for this show. We have uh, Mark Miller on my far right and Larry Becker on my immediate right, and they're here going to talk about a constitutional amendment that they're working on. Real exciting. Uh, and But real, first, I wanted to speak uh, to Mark briefly about how I met him years ago. Or, no, I didn't meet him years ago, but I, I knew his work years ago. And I always admired it, and uh, the Drug Information Network. Yeah, the Drug Information Center at the University Center. of Oregon. Mm -hmm. Right. And the, the highlight of that, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot more to it, but the highlight that I always remembered was if you buy a drug on the street, you could turn in, how, how did they work, how did that work? Well, it was interesting. It was the first anonymous drug analysis project in the country. Uh, the DA here, Pat Horton, realized along with us that if we could show what was really in the substances, we could save lives, keep people from being hurt, perhaps even a, a deterrent to some drug use itself. So the system was set up with farm chem labs down in California, Palo Alto, and the way it worked is you would call in, say you wanted a drug analyzed. We would give you mailing instructions which were legal to that lab, and we gave you, just a voice on the phone, a code number. You would call back in a week, you'd give us the code number, we'd have the results from the drug, and we'd tell you what it is and we got rather famous for that, the everything but where. Um, what was a real surprise is that it was not just used by the youth for illicit drugs, it wound up being used by seniors on a very large scale to protect them from fake drugs down in Mexico that they could have gotten here in the U.S. but were reluctant to prescribe for long mm. periods of time. So wow. it wound up having a lot of benefits. Yeah, wow. And also the results were published in... Yeah, we published the results weekly in the Register yeah. Guard, the Oregonian, so people would be surprised they'd open up the Sunday paper <laughs> and there is half a page on all the drugs that are being analyzed and it was always a real eye-opener. <laughs> yeah, that's incredible. I, I was really admired that, so... Thank you. I mean, it was, was a lot of people putting in to make that happen. Yeah, that was really cool. So anyway, let's talk about the Constitution Amendment and, and Larry, could you Tell us what you're doing and why. <coughs> sure. Um, uh, first of all, the Constitutional Amendment has absolutely nothing to do with marijuana itself. Uh, the reason the marijuana, as far as we can tell, the reason um, the marijuana movement's interested in what we're doing is because marijuana, the marijuana laws were used as a smokescreen, for lack of a better term, to conceal a constitutional crisis. Um, <coughs> the legislature and the governor for the first time in all of Oregon's history since we've had the initiative and referendum in 1902, they've acted together to change an initiative and um, prevent the people from having, having any voice in those changes. Um, uh, the first with, uh, with marijuana specifically, um, Measure 74 uh, overwhelmingly rejected dispensaries uh, when it was when it was uh, proposed in 2010, and the legislature, rather than um, crafting a, you know a, an acceptable dispensary program and sending that back to the people, they instead waited four years, did SB 1531, declared an emergency, and uh, didn't give um, people the the chance to to uh, to vote on it, um, <coughs> and. This has never happened before. Then HB 3400 took Measure 91, which said no changes to the Medical Marijuana Act, among other things, and the legislature spent the entire 2015 session changing both the Medical Marijuana Act and Measure 91 itself. Um, these are unconstitutional actions. The legislature, in the past, whenever it has changed an initiative, um, it's always sent those changes back to the voters in a referendum. And this is true even with the marijuana program. Um, when they increased, there was an initiative that wanted to increase limits to six pounds and so on for, for patients. Um, that was defeated. But then the very next year, 20, the legislator increased, increased patient amounts to what we have today, pound and a half and so on. Um, <clears throat> but they didn't declare an emergency and there was no referendum. The referendum, the ability of the voters to block a law passed by the legislator there's only been 65 referendums in the history of the state, and only 23 of them have succeeded. The referendum is no threat. To the legislature. To the legislature. To the, le the referendum is no threat to, to laws. So they could have, so the legislature used the marijuana laws to, to conceal a power grab. For the first time, an initiative that was passed by the citizens has been changed, and then on top of those changes, the legislature said that this is an emergency. And the two of those things together combine to prevent the citizens from having, um, having any say in the initiative they just passed. 
So our constitutional amendment would take that power away from the legislature by requiring them to send any changes that, that they make to an initiative law back to the voters, like they did, mm -hmm. um, like, like they've done in the past. Mm -hmm. To put it simply, if the voters pass a law and the legislature wants to change it, they have to send it back to the voters for their approval, mm -hmm. which is what has not happened here. In other words, what is the point of voting if it doesn't count? And I think Larry's put that to me rather brilliantly. What also is of concern that Larry pointed out when he first started researching this is this action by the legislature is extremely disturbing. It's the first time in history they've done it. There was one other time, but the governor vetoed it. They've always respected the will of the voters. So by making the changes they did here, we wind up asking, well, did the legislatures, legislators make these changes and weren't aware of how important it was, that, with the way they were doing it, which is very disturbing. But as Larry also put it, if they did know that they were invalidating voters, that they were making something unconstitutional here, that's even more disturbing. So either way, we have an action that the legislature has taken and the governor uh, approved of that for the first time in history has taken away the vote from people. And the initiative is there to make sure that government is responsive. We have lost that ability unless we start getting it back. Mm -hmm. So a little, a little more. Um, so, so consider the Death with Dignity Act, the, the first in the country a physician-assisted suicide law, very controversial. Lots of court challenges, lots of challenges during the process of, of getting that uh, initiative enacted. But when the legislature voted to repeal it, what did they do? They sent, that, they sent that back to the people. Hey, we repealed Death with Dignity, what do you think? And we said, no thank you. We passed Death with Dignity, we'd like to keep it. And so we did. Um, we, we didn't go for the repeal. But another controversial ballot measure, Measure 37, that required uh, cities and counties to reimburse um, landowners for lost value caused by their zoning regulations. It gave them the choice of enforcing those zoning regulations and paying the property owners the lost value caused by those zoning regulations, or they had the choice not to enforce. This was a, a financial and legal catastrophe. It was a poorly drafted measure, generated a lot of lawsuits and so on, but when the legislature drafted 47, I think, Measure 47, to fix those changes, what did it do? Did it declare an emergency? No, it sent it back to the people for a vote. The, the, the emergencies, put another way, laws passed by the people can never constitute an emergency. Um, the, the bill that created dispensaries was passed in 2014, and that was the, declared an emergency, my understanding, at the behest of industry that was gonna profit from it. Um, if it wasn't an emergency in 2010, after the initiative got defeated, it wasn't an emergency in 2014. Patients, you know, marijuana patients, uh, their care is unquestionably um, important, but the legislature used that as a, as a, as a feint. Um, in the past, no matter what, how controversial, they've always sent it back to the voters, and here they couldn't, or they wouldn't, and that's the mistake. Uh -huh. And they can now do it from now on, uh -huh. unless we go there and say, you guys make a change, you send it back for approval. Yeah, definitely. Well, uh, <clears throat> I'm a big fan of the Constitutional Amendment, too, because the, for the simple reason the legislature can't mess with it. Uh, the, bad sign, the bad thing about a Constitutional Amendment is it takes more signatures to get it on the ballot, and your, uh, uh, the opponents can use it against us as saying, well, it's a Constitutional Amendment, and we can't be kind of change the Constitution for every little problem. Uh, uh, True, but this is not every little problem. Oh, I know. No, I know. I, I know. It's true. But that's, I, I was just saying that's what their, their arguments are. But uh, no, I'm, I'm definitely, in fact, Measure 91, uh, I've been saying for years that it, we should have a legalization, constitutional movement, I, I mean, uh, amendment. I have, and I have one that a friend of mine drew up many years ago, <coughs> this one sentence for legalization and it's an amendment, and I can't get anybody to even consider it. Uh, years ago, uh, Lee Berger and Sandy Burbank and a bunch of other people got together and did a rewrite and tried to do uh, tried to do a rewrite and made made a very simple uh, amendment into a complicated measure. <laughs> but they got it registered. They got it ready to go to hang for signature, you know, to uh, gather signatures for it. Uh, Bill Conde actually paid for the first printing, and the reason I know that is because he gave me the cash and I went and printed them. Uh, but he was the first one that actually uh, was behind it and supported it. 
And as soon as we got them printed and started gathering signatures, that was the end of the campaign. I couldn't get anybody to answer, talk to me. Uh, nobody would talk to me. And uh, uh, they dropped it like a hot potato. Uh, Certainly you always tread lightly when you're talking about modifying the Constitution. <coughs> right. And if this were not such a serious situation, if, it was, if, if what was at stake wasn't mm -hmm. whether we have better governance or not based on how the people vote, mm -hmm. we would have not entered this fray. Mm -hmm. Larry's been a lawyer. He understands completely what's at stake. I've always been interested in, in constitutional mm -hmm. law, mm -hmm. sort of as an amateur. And we realize fully you're opening a Pandora's box when you go here. If this were not so important to ensure that the people's vote makes a difference, Definitely. we would have not have done it otherwise. Right. Call up that thing from 1920. <coughs> I like that, uh, yeah. And, and uh, <coughs> the fact that this isn't necessarily a marijuana issue is a great point, too. Uh, well, it's not, uh, the, the amendment itself, we should stress, has yes. absolutely, yes. It, should this amendment pass, right. um, not a single law in the books, including none of the marijuana laws, will change. Um, but it does mean that if people feel the need down the road to make such changes, and if they win the vote, mm -hmm. the legislature, unlike this time, would not be able to undo it unless they send it back for approval. Okay. So like it, this yeah. is for the future. Yeah. So, so back in 1927, 1926, there was an initiative <coughs> that banned certain types of fishing on the s on the first certain types of fishing gear for salmon on the Columbia River. Um, there was a series of these. There's one for the Rogue. There's one for. They're all over the place. But this, this one was the Columbia River, and uh, uh, the people passed it overwhelmingly. The very next session, the legislature basically repealed it. Uh, drafted so many changes to it, it was basically repealed and declared an emergency. But the governor of the day vetoed the entire bill. Um, and that was the last time the legislature has changed an initiative and declared an emergency, was 1926. The 1928 election, the voters were so incensed by what had almost happened, I mean, what the legislature almost did, they didn't do it, but they almost did it. And the, the folks were so upset that they, they, they drafted a constitutional amendment similar to ours, restricting the power of the legislature to change initiatives. Back then, the voters' pamphlets um, only had one argument for Easy and one argument it. against. And this is, a qu this is a quote from the only argument against that amendment back in 1928, the last time the legislature and the governor pulled this stuff. And this is fascinating. And this is, this is from <clears throat> the, the 1928, page 29 of the voters' pamphlet. Had any legislature ever used its power to defeat or even impair popular legislation, such action might justify the adoption of the amendment. But when it is shown by the record that our legislatures have consistently recognized the sovereignty of the people and respected their wishes as expressed in popular measures, its adoption is entirely uncalled for. They drew the line in the sand here, mm -hmm. and now they've crossed it. Yeah, mm -hmm. and what, what, what couldn't be mm -hmm. said back in 1928 can be said now. Um, the legislature has used, in conjunction with the governor, its powers to defeat popular legislation. And that was what it did with SB 1531 and HB 3400, and everybody's focusing on marijuana. It's newsworthy, sure. Marijuana legalization is tremendously newsworthy, but it, it completely misses the constitutional crisis that was created. That's right. excellent. See, I can't remember. That's an important fact. So we got seven Yeah, seconds. so <laughs> we're just kind of closed down on this segment. We're going to have come back right back again and talk about this amendment some more. So we'll be here. If you're an adult who enjoys a good beer, there's a similar product you might want to know about. One without all the calories and serious health problems. Less toxic so it doesn't cause hangovers or overdose deaths, and it's not linked to violence or reckless behavior. Marijuana. Less harmful than alcohol, and time to treat it that way. For more information, visit MarijuanaIsSafer.org. Welcome back to the segment of uh, 599, the second half. And uh, we're here with Mark Miller and Larry Becker. We're talking about the uh, constitutional amendments that they're working on. Uh, and uh, what stage you're at, you're gathering 1,000 signatures of the first stage. Yeah, for those who are familiar with the process, when you're first getting a ballot measure qualified, you get 1,000 subscribers, where you actually go out, and what the Secretary of State call these wet signatures, you go out and physically get them and have people sign a form. Uh, most people consider that you have to get a, be submitting about 2,000 to make sure that 1,000 are verified. Once those 1,000 subscribers are verified, the uh, bill is sent to the, attorney, to the uh, attorney General of the State for wording. Yes. 
And at that point... Ba uh, ballot title. Thank you. Ballot title. That's exactly right. And from that point, uh, it's put out, there may be challenges to the ballot title or not. And if there aren't, then that's what would we go ahead and try to get the uh, about 112,000 signatures we need the requirement for the constitutional amendment. Mm -hmm. And you were right before. The constitutional amendment is the largest number of votes that you have to get. It's the highest burden of proof to get in, if I will. We need, we need yes, so over 100,000 signatures. But this year, for the first time, the Secretary of State's got a, a, um, the ability to download a form from the web that can then be signed and mailed in as opposed to having to stand directly in front of a petition gatherer, right. paid or unpaid. And we are, by the way, out of the 60 plus organizations trying to pass initiatives, we're one of the very few, two or three, that um, are all volunteer. We're not paying signature gatherers, we're not paying anybody. So. Mm -hmm. It's we're <laughs> we're <laughs> counting on three things, really, because we don't have large amounts of funds. We're counting on the fact that we will have TV coverage because this is a constitutional issue, an important one. It would appear that if our measure doesn't pass, all other initiatives could be at risk from legislative intrusion. And mm -hmm. that's what we're trying to make clear they to people. Are, they are. They are. <laughs> it, it's, it's demonstrated they are. Yeah, the line that's never been crossed. Has been crossed. Has agreed. been crossed. So we're trying to convince people of just how important this is to all the initiative movements, whether it's $15 an hour or whatever you think is, is progressive or necessary. Put, put another way, if you're, if you're signing any initiative petition, any initiative petition in Oregon this year, you should sign ours as well, because mm -hmm. ours is the one that makes sure yours initiative, if it gets passed, um, has some teeth. Very true. So <laughs> we're counting on citizen <laughs> outrage, media coverage, and the third thing, the ace up the sleeve, because we don't have money, is the fact that people can download that form, sign it, and send it in. Mm -hmm. So we're begin, mm -hmm. going to be counting on every organization that has, uh, you know, a stake in this game, you know, whether they want their measures are passed, uh, and just citizens making sure that the government can be accountable. <coughs> yeah, you mentioned being grassroots. That reminds me of uh, some of the groups I work with. I always said we're not we're we're not grassroots. We're not even up to that level yet. We're below we're, we're below that. <laughs> <laughs> what was that phrase? They tried to stomp us out. They forgot we were seeds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is, uh, yeah, that's a great point. That this is uh, a matter for more than just in uh, marijuana uh, concerns. This is about our whole voting process concerns, especially the legislature. And gun uh, I was very disgusted what they've done with the marijuana issue. Uh, Larry's brought up an amazing point that I keep thinking of. And this, sometimes there are people who don't think the initiative process is the way to go. We understand that it can be used by both sides of the political aisle. It's an instrument. But the fact is, in this age of Citizen United, unbridled lobbying, ethics commissions that aren't, one has to ask, where do you get your say? Where, what do we do in this age of Citizen United to make sure that your vote counts? And Larry's brought this up to me a number of times, and the more I think about it, the more I realize we're at a real crucial stage here. We have seen in petition gathering, most people are very supportive, but the resistance that we do see, surprisingly, comes from teachers. Um, teachers in the state, people involved in the education process were um, horribly damaged, I guess, long term, and the education of, of the state by measure five. Mm -hmm. um, and that was, and, and people have uh, still hurt over that. Um, but the fact of the matter is that since measure five was enacted, there's been a number of changes on the way the initiative is done that makes it more transparent. And so th the misuse of the process that was a little easier to do then can't be done now. And plus, without the initiative, it, 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 yeah, they've had 20 plus years to change Measure 5 into something that they can, yeah. that they can w live with and they've not done it. And the legislature's not done it. So, so what do they propose? <laughs> you know, what are they go what are they going to do if they want to change? If they want something better, you'll so, need the initiative, mm -hmm. right? They'll need the initiative, and they'll need an initiative that sticks. Mm -hmm. So, um, but we, but it's it's been very difficult. The emotion around Measure Five is tremendous, and it's something we're, we're something we're well aware of. You were going through the list of all the progressive items that the initiative process has produced in this state that people sometimes forget. Women's suffrage, for example. Uh, the women in Oregon got the vote through, the, initi through the initiative yeah. process. Men had to do that initiative, by the way, but um, since women couldn't vote, they couldn't do the initiative, but men, had, men did it, um, and on the third try, they succeeded. Um, and the Death with Dignity Act, we've mentioned. Um, marijuana. And, and the marijuana laws themselves, yeah. None of those would have been, none of those were possible in the legislature if they had to be done by initiative. 
Look, the, my research shows it, it's, it's unequivocal. There's no doubt that, uh, and, and anybody can find this out, and it's astonishing that the media hasn't talked about it, but the, the purpose of the initiative has always been because the legislature and the governor were unresponsive to the needs of the people. Back in 1902, that was the whole debate. It remains that way today. And in any encroachment upon the initiative sh in this day of Citizens United and, and uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, you guys are aware, for example, that after the defeat of the pipeline now, international corporations are suing for the right to build that pipeline. In this kind of world, um, the people feel like they don't have a voice, and the initiative is one of the ways. It's just keep, about the only yeah, thing they have. That's all, that's all we've got. And Oregon's been, always been bleeding edge with that, and, and, there's, and we should remain so. We acknowledge the work of student Uren and what he gave to the state through his efforts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well that's, and that's uh, right now it's, uh, it's uh, number 54. ID petition 54. ID petition uh, 54. It won't, it won't appear that way, though, on the, on the ballot okay. title. It'll yeah. be changed. Okay, yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's just a uh, preliminary number for the first stage. And <coughs> we'll be posting that website where you can go and uh, actually sign the, the uh, amendment. If you would like to be a signature gatherer, contact us. You can become an authorized agent. You can be helping us get the numbers we need to make sure that our government stays responsive. That's right. And gathering signatures is really got a lot of fun, especially if you enjoy talking to people, uh, because uh, you get pros and cons, and, and uh, it's just always been a, a, a to You're me, it's been an interesting experience. Everything, everybody who's even thinking about this, working on it, helping us, even voting, they're all part of this process, as Larry keeps pointing out. This is democracy at work. This mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. when we let you know that this is available for signing, that there are issues involving the sanctity of your vote and the ability to influence government. We're all taking part in the process. It's all very important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. People don't realize that the Constitution and the Oregon, the judges the, um, that have answered the question, they make no distinction between laws passed by the people and laws passed by the legislature. The, and the Constitution specifically lists both under legislative powers. Um, the legislature um, clearly doesn't think this way um, based on their recent actions. And also, if you go to the, just go on their website, look up, look, look on the Oregon, Oregon website for the legislature, and it won't list anything about the people. You have to go to the Secretary of State's website and, and learn about initiatives there. But if you check out the legislative branch um, on Oregon's own, the Oregon government's own website, it won't even mention the people. We the people are a balancing power to the government or to the governor and to the legislature. We have to make sure we exercise that or, if you will, the tail can wag the dog. Yeah, I, uh, when Measure 91 passed, uh, uh, the, uh, or, or rather, excuse me, when the legislature went into session after 91 passed, uh, there was a bunch of quotes by a bunch of key people, including my state senator, Lee Beyer, that said, well, he said, we, uh, this is, a, this is a, uh, an initiative, an initiative that can be changed. Right. He said the people didn't know what they had voted on. Yeah. And that is, yeah. that's an insult to the voters who considered yeah. this issue. <laughs> if, if we, well, this is not about marijuana. The fact is it's been the crucible that caused a lot of this. Keep in mind that groups responsible groups approach the legislature asking for them to come up with a solution to the legalization quagmire and the medical marijuana the quagmire we face in this state. The legislature refused to act. The people went and sponsored an initiative which passed. The people spoke. And what does an individual like Lee Byers do? He says, obviously they didn't know what they were doing. We need to make changes. And did they make changes? Did they spend the time on the legal aspects of the drug? No. They did exactly what they were told not to do three times in 91. They spent the majority of their time trying to re-regulate the medical marijuana market when in fact they understand very little about it, have misimpressions of the program, and the program does nothing to defend itself so they can understand what the medical marijuana program is. It is an alternative to being addicted to opiates in many cases these days, and that is simply not recognized by people. That was a poster that I made up and posted on Facebook. I said, Oregon Legislature, keep Please uh, keep your uh, clueless, biased hands off of our marijuana laws. Of course, they didn't listen to me, but I thought it was uh, <coughs> put it the way it really is. So <laughs> this is interesting and uh, exciting to have uh, uh, the uh, 
an amendment that could actually make the legislature do what they're supposed to do. What a unique situation there we have there. Well, they can <laughs> they can make changes. No one's saying no. Mm -hmm. We're saying mm -hmm. send it back to the voters for exactly. approval if like, you yeah. do. Like they have for 113 years. Yeah. Between, yeah. Two th between 1902 and 2014, they set every change they made to an initiative back to the people for approval. <coughs> sometimes we approved, sometimes we didn't. And, and, uh, and That's part know, of the process. And Senator Breyer and all these other senators that, that you know, I think I, I've heard that, that, that there's been some um, remorse on their part. They think they've they've changed. They've gone too far. They've changed 91. But um, uh, the fact of the matter is, and, and and one of the criticisms that that we get um, that this this bill would our, our amendment would hamstring the legislature and make it harder for them to make changes um, uh, to our bills. But but again, historically they've never done it. Um, they they've never found themselves in a situation. Um, until it was marijuana for some reason, where they had to declare an emergency when they were making changes to an initiative law. So, so that criticism um, has been there for 113 years and has never come, has never, it's never happened. So, uh, but, but we expect to hear that, oh, you'll hamstring the legislature. No, we won't, because, it's because they've always respected the will of the people. We're just past. asking them to go back to what they've always done that yeah. proved very effective before. Yeah, yeah. Well, that sounds good to me, and we're going to wrap up this segment of the, sh the show. Uh, so, any little, um, quick comments? About 10, 15 seconds. Oh, you can always uh, take a look at us at www.restoretheinitiative.org. You'll see a very brief, concise slideshow there explaining exactly what we're doing and why it's so critical. And we need your support and your help. Please contact us if you can. Take a look at the donation page. We're fighting a huge fight with very few resources, and we're doing it on the citizen's behalf. Join in, help us. You bet. So we appreciate it. That was Mark Miller, and we got Larry Becker and Thank your you. host, Dank. And thanks for coming in and uh, stopping and watching our show. And please go on the website and support these gentlemen. They're doing some great work and fighting for us. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate it. Thanks, thanks for Dan. being here. You okay. bet. This is great. So I'll be here next week, and I hope you will be too. We'll see you then. <laughs>